Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and in this podcast, I'm going to talk about plants. More appropriately, we're going to talk about land plants. And so they have a great diversity on our planet. If it weren't for plants, we literally would not be able to survive on our planet. And so let's start with looking at their phylogeny. So here are all the eukaryotes on our planet. So basically, these are all things that have a nucleus, and they're going to have a uh, organelles. And so if we break off of this, this is a pretty ancient lineage. In other words, plants have been separated for a long time. Who are the things they're more related to? Well, red algae would be one right next door, but we're going to have green plants plants right here. Well, most of these are all going to be protists, but you can see us right here, animals, and then fungi right next to that. And so plants are important for the role they play in our lives. If we zoom more into their phylogeny itself, there are going to be some things that you're familiar with, like mosses and maybe liverworts and hornworts, but we're also going to have seed plants all the way down here. You don't have to learn all of these. These are simply the way that they're starting to be classified, but there are four groups that you should be familiar with that I've chosen, and those are going to be the bryophytes, so those are going to be like the mosses, the ferns, the gymnosperms, and then the angiosperms. And the reason I've chosen those four is that they're monophyletic, in other words, they share common ancestry with each other, so we know that they're related, but they also show these four evolutionary steps uh, in the movement of plants from water to land. All right, let's talk about some of their characteristics. So they're eukaryotic, we know that, they have a nucleus and organelles, they're also autotrophs. In other words, they're going to take energy from the sun and they're going to use chlorophyll A to make sugars for themselves. And so they are self-feeders. They all have cell walls and that cell walls are going to be made up of cellulose, which is uh, polysaccharide, but it's going to have a lot of uh, extra bonds on there that make it really, really durable. Um, another chemical that I could have written here is sporopollenin, that they have uh, this really resistant chemical that can also protect their spores. Um, they're terrestrial. In other words, all of these plants are, are what do we call land plants. Sometimes we refer to those as embryophytes, but they all live on land. And so things like seaweed aren't going to be technically plants. And things like kelp are going to be protists, and so they're not plants as well. And so all these things on here live uh, on land. The only exception to that would be like water lilies, which we think moved on to land and then moved back into the water. All plants are also going to show alternated, alternation of generation, and that's part of their reproductive structure, and I'll show you that on the next slide. But the big thing, and it's where they actually get their name, is that they all have protected embryos, land plants. In other words, this would be a baby plant protected by material around the outside, and so all plants are going to have one structure in their life when you have this little baby embryophyte, and that's what shares uh, was shared between all plants. Alternation of generation is a term that you should understand, especially when we're talking about plants, and basically what it means is that there are two life cycles in plants. We have the haploid life cycle, remember that's going to be when you have one set of all the chromosomes, and then the diploid. Now botanists have given specific names to these, and so the haploid portion we call the gametophyte, and then the diploid portion we're going to call the sporophyte. In humans, let's think about that. What are the different diploid and haploid uh, parts of our life cycle? Well, the diploid is going to be me. It's all the cells in my body. And then the haploid portion is only going to be the gametes or the sex cells. But in plants, lots of times that gametophyte will actually be a part of the plant, multicellular part of the plant. So let's look how this plays out in ferns. So basically what you're going to have is meiosis, which creates spores. Since we've undergone meiosis, we've got some variability here, but we also now have reduced our chromosome number down to N, or haploid. So now we have mitotic growth of these, and that's going to create the gametophyte portion. And that's going to be this really small portion below what you might think of as the fern. We then are going to have mitosis fertilization. That's going to create a sporophyte, and that sporophyte is going to be the diploid portion. And then we have that cycle over and over again. Things like mosses, most of the, what you see in a moss is going to be gametophyte, but as we move up towards things like a conifer tree, like a big tree, what you're mostly looking at, just like when you're looking at in humans, is going to be the sporophyte or the diploid portion. How do they make energy? Well, they're going to make energy through a process, process called photosynthesis. So they're taking energy from the sun and they're converting that into sugars. Why are they doing that? They're doing that so they can store the energy, they can build structures out of it, but they can also use cellular respiration to release the energy in the form of ATP. In other words, they are self-sufficient, and we are simply parasites on plants. 
As I mentioned before, there are four big groups that you should understand when it comes to plants, and those are also going to show you the four major steps that plants went through to dominate our planet. And so basically we're going to start here deep in the ocean because that's where plants started as something similar to seaweed. And so basically what they were able to do is move on to land, they were able to move uh, material around, they then came up with a seed, and then finally they came up with a flower. And so the movement onto land was the first step. Some of the organisms on our planet, the bryophytes, which are like the mosses, Basically, they're similar to what some of the first plants on our planet had. They were definitely green, but they couldn't be very tall because in order to move water around, they could only do it through diffusion. They didn't have vessels inside them that could move the water. And so these are generally re really, really short, and they're also found in areas where there's enough rainwater on the bryophytes that they can actually get, get water that way. Next movement then is the vascular tissues show up. And so the bryophytes are going to be separated from these vascular plants. They have true tissues. And so basically what they're going to have are these xylem and phloem that can move material around. Once we can move material, especially water, from our roots to our shoots, then sizes got really, really big. We didn't have to live only in really, really wet areas. Uh, and we didn't have to be really low to the ground. And so the next big jump was the ferns. Next thing is the evolution of the seed. The seed allowed them to protect that uh, embryophyte and it can dry out totally. And then we can uh, eventually can start a new plant. Uh, cycad's an example of a gymnast sperm, but so are all these conifers over here. If we break down the word, it's naked seed. And so that's going to be this group. And then finally we have what are called the angiosperms. And that's the evolution of the flower. Uh, what's the function of a flower? The flower co-evolved with insects and it gave them an ability to reproduce. So basically what are these flowers doing? They're advertising to insects to, to come here. We've got some nectar and then when you go there you're going to pick up a little pollen and you're going to move it somewhere else. And this has allowed them to be incredibly successful. But even though you might not be able to see a flower, almost every plant on our planet that you can think of is going to be an angiosperm. So let's think about grass. Well, they're uh, pollinated by the wind and so the winds gonna move their pollen and so they don't have to have a very fancy flower because they're not ad advertising for insects but that again is the evolution of plants those four big groups again are the bryophytes the ferns the gymnosperms example would be the conifer those were what were around when the dinosaurs were around and then finally we have the angiosperms and so those are plants I love plants because I eat them or I eat things that eat plants and I hope that's helpful.